So again, thanks for coming. My name is Tony Schultz. I'm the chair of the Boston section of AES. And uh, a few months ago when we had an event in this room with Don Keel, a uh, guy was uh, one of the attendees and approached me about this topic we're going to learn about tonight. And I thought that was a, a really interesting topic. And we had actually talked about it previously before approached on this. Um, so hopefully we'll have a lot of information given to us on this. And I'm sure that he'll answer some questions when he's through. And uh, so without further ado, I introduce Guy Fidokow. Hi, my name is, my name is Guy Fedorkow. Uh I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about uh, an activity uh, going on at the IEEE uh, called 802.1 AVB. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what that is and what, uh, what maybe we can expect to see coming out of this work and how it will impact the world of audio and video. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, let me call a, a, a graphical representation of the AVD committee's mission. <laughs> okay, so we've all seen this kind of thing, right? <laughs> uh, this is what we have now, and uh, this is the AVD vision. Right? So the, <clears throat> the basic idea behind this stuff is that uh, Ethernet has been the most successful networking technology we've, uh, you know, we've seen in the history of technology. Um, we've, in the networking world, gradually managed to draw more and more things together onto a common network infrastructure. Uh, and for, uh, for local area networks, Ethernet is the thing. Um, so the intent is to take this uh, except for this part and that part. Um, <laughs> take that and converge that all onto Ethernet so that you don't need to have you know, this kind of connector and that kind of connector and that kind of connector and those kind of fibers and those kind of things. Just make it all Ethernet. So one plug to plug all your stuff together. That's, the, that's what makes <coughs> people who are working on ABB, that's what makes them go, is to try and achieve that goal. So with that as a starting point, let's back up a little bit. Um, in the course of this uh, presentation, and uh, in spite of what Tony said, please don't wait until the end if you want to ask a question, stick up your hand. Um, in the course of uh, the presentation, what I'd like to talk about is um, who's doing this ABB stuff, uh, what's it for, why is it not piece of cake, you know, what's, what's, the chance, what's so hard about this, um, what do they actually do to solve some of these problems, and then uh, a couple of slides on where to go to learn more if you want to learn more about it. Okay? Questions? No. Okay. So let's start. Um, IEEE, I would guess that everybody knows <coughs> Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineers. Um, a broad range of standards come out of the IEEE, all kinds of different stuff. But uh, there's one uh, standards group called 802, which uh, owns uh, a range of networking technology. Uh, of that, there's a, sub, a subgroup called 802.1, which owns uh, Ethernet. Uh, so anything to do with standardization of Ethernet goes through 802.1. Uh, and then within 802.1, there's a, a sub sub subcommittee called AVB, which uh, is responsible for uh, enhancing the existing 802.1 suite of Ethernet standards to uh, incorporate the bits and pieces needed to carry uh, audio and video across, across Ethernet. Um, as we, you know, a couple of us discussed at the beginning of the meeting, the, you know, uh, media across the Ethernet is, of course, not a new thing. Uh, lots of people have been getting various kinds of media across the Ethernet. The thing that's, I think, that's unique about this work is that these are the guys who own Ethernet. So if they say, you should put this into Ethernet, then there's a good chance that almost everybody who makes Ethernet will say, Oh, okay. You know, whereas if 
Okay? I, <clears throat> I know the Cobranet guys, and they're good guys, but if Cobranet comes along and says, you should put this into Ethernet, uh, you know, the Broadcoms and Marvells of the world will say, and who are you again? So uh, by having this work actually going through IEEE, I think there's a chance that it certainly improves the chance that it'll actually stick and that it'll get traction and people will pay attention. Um, within the IEEE, it's a little bit hard to tell exactly who's a participant and who's not, but there are you know, a good list of people who are involved in the development of this ABB stuff. Um, um, my former employer, Cisco Systems, on one end from the network side, um, and down to some of the consumer companies. As, <clears throat> as I've, again, in, in conversation ahead of this meeting, have complained, the pro audio guys are kind of driving the bus for ABB at the moment, and we need more consumer representation because um, in order to really be successful, this 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 must play out in the consumer space as well. But why? Pardon me. Why? Volume. Volume. Yeah, that's right. I mean, consumers gave us HDMI. Uh, that's why. That's why I want to see more consumer companies working, you know, participating in a positive way in this development, so that uh, so that we don't get another HDMI, which is off in a corner and does its own weird thing. Right. The point is to. <coughs> What, what the ABB committee has focused on doing, and again, this is something that the IEEE can uniquely do, they, they own Ethernet. And so they have zero um, motivation to do anything that disturbs Ethernet on, you know, in, in, in any unnatural way. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, they have every motivation to put the stuff in that you really need to get this to work and to do it in a way that the, the vast part of the world that just uses Ethernet for ordinary Ethernet doesn't look at it and say, oh, you, know, you are ruining our network. Um, and I think you know, as we work through this, you'll see that the changes to require the Ethernet itself to make this work are relatively modest and, and consequently uh, I think there's a good chance that, and who knows what really happens, but there's a good chance that this could just become a natural part of Ethernet. You know, that there won't be, it's not like here's the HDMI network here, and here's the everything else network here. It's just, here's Ethernet. Of course it does real-time audio video, we expect. Um, so we're not, we're certainly not there, but there's, this approach seems to have a hope of Oh, getting there. That's my theory. That is, <clears throat> and not just mine, of course. That's why they're doing it. <clears throat> okay. Well, in fact, we sort of discussed this. The um, the work that's going on now um, is done with the idea that this technology will be used uh, at least in three different areas of the body that have been identified so far. Um, the professional professional AV and, and in fact, uh, to be honest, I have to say it's really professional A at the moment that's, that's pushing this. Um, uh, consumer, and again, as we say consumer, you, you really like to have on board to get the volumes up and the cost down. And the one I hadn't expected is automotive, that there's, <coughs> we all know, that there's a lot of wires in cars these days. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I hadn't appreciated that, they, that the automotive guys are also starting to look around at all of the different proprietary interconnects that they've accumulated over the years and wondering if they can toss a lot of that stuff overboard and focus again on a single network infrastructure. Uh, and if the uh, if the AVB stuff can provide what they need for entertainment systems, then that would be an attraction. So there, the automotive is actually one of the more active uh, second to pro audio automotive is, is, is the second most active in the committee currently. And I'm, I'm trying to find, 
I'm trying to find the consumer guys to, to, to participate to uh, even out the balance. Well, the, the people that are interested in it, how did they get involved? I mean, did you go to them? Did they come to a group for that? Uh... Oh, um, well, let me see. Uh, let, let me sit, I can I can tell you a little bit of history there. Um, uh, you, you'll you'll tell in a minute that um, my background is networking um, with uh, with some with some authentic audio experience, but mostly networking. Um, um, I've been involved with ABB now for six or nine months, so I certainly wasn't there as they started, but. But the process is very open. If you, any any company, anyone who thinks they might be interested, you can just show up. And um, uh, if you if you if you want, you can just show up and sit in the room and be a mushroom and, and listen. Um, but um, more helpfully, you can show up and just contribute. Um, there is a formal process. When it comes to actually ratifying the documents, there's a formal process, and you have to be a member and all that kind of stuff, and have a designated voting member and all that. But um, in or just in order to participate and help to direct the the standard, you don't have to be invited. You don't have to just just turn up. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to. Uh, uh, Provide a few more details on how to do that if anyone is is actually interested um, uh, at the end of the at the end of the deal. Um, my own connection with this, um, as you saw in the first slide, I am serving as a consultant for uh, Adamson Systems, which uh, is a manufacturer of enormous loudspeaker systems for uh, uh, live sound reinforcement and. Tony, I have to say, when Don was standing here, he showed the picture of the, you know, the big line array. He said, 19 kilowatts. And I was going, it's really small, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it depends on your point of view. But uh, so, anyways, I, I'm consulting for Adamson. Um, Adamson <coughs> was interested in getting into the network audio business. So, uh, I work with Adams and Bolt as a, uh, a participating on, be on Adams and behalf in the standards committee, uh, and also uh, in helping to, to direct their internal developments in this area. So, um, no excuses. If anyone knows someone who ought to be participating and has the time, then they should do it. Okay. Um, applications. Uh, the one thing you might say is, well, wait a minute. Why do we need anything? Because you can obviously get content across the internet already. You know, audio, video. What's the problem? It's all in your web browser. What are you talking about? Um, the thing that you can't do so easily with the existing internet protocol suite is make it real time and make it <coughs> uh, make it dependable over the last uh, the last segment of the network so the 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 AVB focus is to make um, make real time uh, audio and video streaming work in a LAN environment as a, a local area network which, uh, as we all know, uh, lots of people's houses now contain relatively sophisticated local area networks to wire all of the, excuse me, all of the weird computing gear that people collect in their houses. Um, so with the addition of the ABB protocols, um, we can make <coughs> the same local area network that's used for uh, you know, internet streaming and email and web browsing and peer-to-peer -peer and God knows what else. Um, make that also be the network that carries uh, real-time media within a within a home. Um, and uh, this wireless thing is is another reason why it would be good to have a couple more consumer guys uh, plugged into this because it's it's 
supposed to work, but um, good to have some people who knew a little bit more about that. Um, so anyways, this is a, a relatively modest, uh, these installations you think of as relatively modest in size, um, not terribly demanding in terms of you know, what you think of as pro audio specifications, but um, very demanding in terms of being able to take random stuff and plug it together and have a hope of getting it to work. Um, so that, that to me represents the, the consumer focus. Um, the end of the business that I work on in the, the, uh, the live sound pro audio application, uh, I mean, again, this is just another, another example, would be the kind of <coughs> uh, uh, classic live music concert venue kind of situation where um, there's uh, you know a, a bunch of gear on a stage, there's a front of house, a, uh, a, mix, a couple of mixing consoles, a bunch of effects boxes, um, uh, uh, you know some kind of controller devices, um, some kinds of uh, modest data networking stuff. Uh, and then back on the stage end of the thing, um, a couple hundred different sources of streaming content uh, and and perhaps uh, you know 50 or 100 or 150 loudspeakers, power speakers with with network connections. So the intention would be able to would be to wire all of this stuff up together on one Ethernet. Uh, and have it all networked together and, and be able to um, monitor it and control it and diagnose it from a, from a front of house location. And of course, to build in enough redundancy so that when the forklift driver drives over the wrong thing, um, you still have a, a working <coughs> system. So this, this, to me, represents the other, you know, the other end of the spectrum in the, in the, the ABB space. Um, and I know there are people involved who are also interested in um, the uh, you know, recording studio kind of application as well. Where it's um, this, the <clears throat> the numbers are a little bit different, but the scale factors are probably about the same. You know, a few hundred of this, a few hundred of those wired together in a in a local area network. Okay. Questions on applications. So this is standard gigabit Ethernet as it exists now. Uh, yeah. So uh, yes, AVB is specifically defined to work with um, uh, 100 megabit and gigabit Ethernet. Um, it, as we'll see, it uh, it doesn't work. Uh, it has not been made to work on on 10 megabit uh, and half duplex Ethernet. Um, it's intended to work with wireless. Uh, I, I, myself, I think there's some soft spots there, not, not surprisingly. Um, it, it could certainly work on 10 gigabit Ethernet, but in, in none of the application spaces are anywhere near doing 10 gig Ethernet yet. So I think as soon as anyone cares, it's trivial to make it happen. But yes? Just to sort of a figure of merit, how many channels can you get down one uh, <laughs> I, I have that number in my head. Um, hundreds. Uh, through a, a, a gigabit fiber, you can get hundreds, hundreds of channels. It depends on um, the obvious thing. It depends on is the is the coding rates that you choose. Well, I was thinking. Sorry. Linear PCR. Yes, that's right. So the normal the the uh, the, I keep having to remember. Oh, there's video too. But audio, um, the 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 baseline assumption is it is 24-bit PCM uh, coding with 4896 or 192 kilohertz sample rates. Um, and 96 kilohertz, uh, I think I say I have this memorized, but it's a few hundred channels. Um, there's, uh, I don't want to rattle on this, but there are uh, a couple of 
the standard allows various configurations of how you divide channels into into streams, and that changes the the number of channels you can fit. But you know, think of a couple hundred. Yes. You, you said gigabit. You said cat six. Um, yeah, sorry. No, no, it's yeah. So a, a gigabit uh, would go over cat six over a short distance. Uh, I I will admit when I point here, I'm I'm thinking fiber because it's a long a long haul. Uh, and in fact, for this this kind of network, um, 100 megabit is 100 megabit is a good thing here because it's lower cost, and gigabit fiber is a good thing here because it's longer reach uh, and higher bandwidth. So I expect to see a mixture of both in the in these networks. Okay. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about technical challenges in this stuff. Um, let's say I'm a networking guy. If I'm saying stuff that doesn't make sense, stick up your hand, please. Um, I assume that people are mostly okay with the idea of what you do with an Ethernet is you make packets and you send packets across the Ethernet. And so uh, the, everything that flows across a, an Ethernet cable is in the form of these packets, is bundles of bytes that are collected together in, uh, into a unit that cannot be uh, interrupted. So uh, for standard Ethernet, that means up to 1,500 bytes get collected together into a packet. Um, the, the basic idea behind Ethernet switching is um, on one side of your switch, you might have a bunch of interfaces which are bringing traffic into the switch. Let me back up just a moment here. When I say the switch, I mean, you know, Ethernet switch is like, uh, you know, like a Linksys box with a bunch of Ethernet plugs on it. So traffic might be coming in through a bunch of plugs, and it might all be trying to get out through one plug. All these plugs maybe are 100 megabit plugs, and if you have 300 megabits worth of packets coming in and 100 megabits worth of packets going out, then say something is going to happen. And what happens for a little while is that you collect them up in a packet buffer, you know, the holding a holding tank. Um, but pretty soon that gets full, and then stuff gets tossed into, uh, this is what we refer to as the bit bucket. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the problems, one of the fundamental problems in data networking is how to manage uh, what happens, you know, what do you do when this happens? Uh, and of course, uh, what we want to do in ABB is to make sure that it doesn't happen. We want to make sure that we never let too much traffic in and that buffers never overflow because of the real-time traffic, okay? So that's one of the problems we're gonna look at solving. Is that okay? Okay. Next problem. Um, <clears throat> if you have ever, uh, let me see, if you might uh, stream uh, the sound for your TV, you know, the, the program, they're playing the political thing on the TV and the radio, so you stream the radio and you watch the TV and you think, they're off by 27 seconds, <laughs> and say, we have a problem here, and that would be synchronization. So uh, networks induce delay, um, and in order to make sure that the sound and the other sound on the picture uh, all come out, uh, synchronized, you need to have some way of compensating for the different delays through a network. And there are many sources of delay, and many of them are very hard to control. So uh, uh, um, if you take a random network and you know wire up this stuff, uh, unless you do something, um, these things are not going to be synchronized. Right? So the second point of AVB is to make sure that under the right constraints, that um, no matter how your network is wired, uh, the result comes out synchronized. And of course, uh, if you just care about keeping 
the sound and the picture kind of synchronize, then maybe, I don't know, probably 100 milliseconds is good. But if you care about uh, a predictable stereo image, then you really like to have synchronization in the microseconds. So you know, it's a good challenge. Um, the third thing is um, <clears throat> with real-time media streaming, of course, uh, we talked about network congestion at the start. Um, if you have too much traffic flowing into a switch, then uh, more traffic coming in than will go out, then something is going to get dropped. Um, what you want to do is make sure that for your real-time streaming traffic, um, if you let the stream start at all, you want to make sure that there's enough bandwidth for all of the stream to get through the network. And if there isn't enough bandwidth, you don't want it to start at all. This is the same as the as the telephone network. Um, if you uh, pick up the phone and you get dial tone, then you're okay to dial. Uh, if you pick up the phone, it doesn't happen much anymore. But if you pick up the phone and you don't get dial tone, um, you don't get to even start. Right? <coughs> so the, the the dial tone is a signal that there is enough and within the network to let you start. And of course, if you dial and you can't get all the way through, then you won't get the connection. Maybe a more relevant analogy would be AT&T's wireless. Yeah. Yeah, except that they're not so good at it. In the wired network, once you got the connection, you could you would not lose it until you gave it up. And I suppose that's supposed to happen in wireless, but it's a little bit less reliable. Um, but the point here um, is that uh, if we're going to have these two sources going to these two destinations, um, you know, obviously these links all have to have enough bandwidth for one, but this link through here needs to have enough bandwidth for both of them. Uh, so the uh, ABB protocols provide a way to tell you know, for this, these, all four of these guys to agree that there is enough bandwidth through every path in the network to get to where they need to go. Yes? So I, this is kind of a technical question. And does each media source then have to, like the packets that they send out, do they have to embed in like a header or some part mm -hmm. of the packet the information that like I expect need this many, you know, bits per second of bandwidth to inform the switches downstream that what kind of a monster that they're connected to, uh, if it's a big one or a little one. A big monster or a little monster. Right. Yes, that's right. And, and then that means how much, then that means uh, what their response is going to be like. They might say, hey, no way, we can't handle that exactly. at all. Yes. Or that's right. So there is a phase that's just like, that's like dialing the phone. And we'll talk about it in a moment. But there's a phase that's you know like dialing the phone where you accept that you get to sell not just with the phone, of course, you only get one kind of connection, so there aren't big right. ones and little ones. But, but with this one, you, you you make a connection in which you say how much bandwidth you want, <coughs> right. and the network says okay or not okay. Right. Right. Now about the delay thing on the previous slide, does is there information about like the origin time or something of the data so that the guy in the back end can just can figure out how it's going to line it up? Yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay. Sorry, I'm. Oh, that's good. It's it's you're you're you're, you're getting the getting the picture. Okay, so I think that covers the the, the major technical challenges that need to be solved with ABB, um, and of course the point is to do this in a way that it fits into the existing uh, Ethernet infrastructure. Right, so we're not designing a new network. What we're going to do is we're going to take Ethernet and we're going to change as little as possible so that we get these, so that we solve those those problems in a way that we get reliable real-time transport. Um, so let me see what some of the components. Um, there is uh, this is not uh, a, this is a there is a default parameter which says you ought to be able to get two milliseconds of end-to-end -end delay through a seven-hop Ethernet network. So that's the baseline starting point. The, the, it turns out that the, the 
value of 2 is programmable, as we say. But the default value is the expectation is that 2 milliseconds ought to be enough. Um, there is a component of AVB which provides the very precise timing synchronization that you'd need to make sure that the sources play out at the right time. Uh, and, and the target is set for uh, about one microsecond of accuracy. That's probably a number that's well beyond what, uh, <coughs> shall we say, a normal audiophile would need. But 192 kilohertz sampling also might be a little bit beyond that, too. So anyways, it doesn't hurt. Uh, and then finally, there's a, a component for uh, so-called dead machine control, as we discussed, to decide which traffic gets led into the network and which does not. Uh, again, on the assumption that if you are allowed into the network, then you should be able to, to, to deliver your traffic without any loss. And if the network is not able to do that, then it should not let you in in the first place. Okay? <clears throat> when you uh, were dubious in the one microsecond, uh, what number were you more thinking is rational? Oh, uh, mm -hmm. should be careful. Yeah, I, I mean, I would have guessed five, just from the uh, five microseconds is an awfully short uh, piece of air. Um, uh, so I, <clears throat> it's hard for me to believe that even five microseconds is actually important, but say, um, um, I can't claim to have researched the matter. <coughs> kind of like a jitter specification, though, so it can accumulate in horrible ways if down a seven is pop. Um, or will this be more like an offset? Yeah, I mean, this is supposed to be across all seven, the, you know, the, the accuracy across all seven is supposed to be within one microsecond. So it would be like between speakers, there might be a, a, a constant error of one microsecond. That, yes. Yeah. Somebody who claims to have golden ears might be able to hear a change in you know, localization or something. Um, yes. <laughs> Someone, exactly. Someone might be able to claim that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So am I going to get in trouble if I say anything about monster tables? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. You probably have people who agree with you. Yeah, okay. So I, there, uh, then I'll, I'll uh, take my life in my hands. There's, uh, I, I think there's a great opportunity here for uh, AVB rated Ethernet cables. You know, you can imagine them to, to speak around. They'll yeah. sound better. Oh, yeah, gold gold you've got spun, it. Gold yeah. spun. There, you, you see, you're on to it already. Okay. <laughs> okay, ABB is very important. Um, so from a, from a standards point of view, um, so I'm going to transition a little bit into what is actually in these standards. From a standards point of view, um, there is not a single ABB specification, but there are uh, four... Uh, so far, four elements which go into uh, existing uh, and sort of existing um, uh, specifications. So there is a there is a thing called 802.1 AS, which does the synchronization. Right? It gets the clocks synchronized, and again, we'll talk about a little bit about how that works. Um, there, uh, these two QAT and QAV are um, uh, additions <coughs> to a very large specification called 802.1Q, which uh, is uh, covers uh, what's initially covered what was called VLANs in uh, in Ethernet, and over the years has uh, accumulated all kinds of uh, valuable additions. Um, so there's a, a QAT <coughs> is the reservation protocol um, that. It's used to decide whether to allow a stream into the network or not. Um, QAV is uh, a modest change to the uh, queuing architecture in an Ethernet switch to uh, ensure that the, the audio video packets don't get dropped, that you, you preserve. If you've allowed them into the network, 
you allow them in because you know that there's enough bandwidth and therefore there's never a time when you should intentionally drop a, a, an AV packet and that's what this uh, ensures. Um, the fourth one, uh, 1722, um, if we're going to move, uh, you know, th these have all been kind of infrastructure. If we're going to move the streaming content from point A to point B, we've got to package it in Ethernet packets. And if we want it to be interoperable, then the two ends have to agree on the format of the streaming data in those Ethernet packets. Um, <coughs> people who People who once worked for router companies might say, wait, don't you have RTP already? Wouldn't that do? And indeed, maybe it would. But um, in this environment, uh, the committee chose to do a, a special purpose transport protocol called 1722, which uh, is similar in broad intent to what uh, real-time protocol does, RTP does in the internet. And again, we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Okay? Uh, question. Yes. Just a refresher. Uh, where is the transport layer located? Oh. Um, I, I remember the, oh, I that, remember all the layers, that, but I don't remember what it does. That darn ISO stack thing. Yeah. <laughs> what does it do? Just what does it do? Show? Yeah, that's the important part. Yeah. Um, uh, um, let me go back here. Uh, so the uh, QAT, the Stream Reservation Protocol, is, a con is what we would call a control plane protocol. This, it's, uh, the control plane is, is, again, pardon me for fixing on telephones, but it's like dialing the phone. You're not talking to the other person when you make the reservation with QAT, QAT, your media source is talking to switches, talking to other switches, arguing about if you have enough, and so on and so forth. When that's done, then you get a response here which says, it's OK. Go ahead. Start sending your stream. And at that point, what you probably have over here um, in a, in a real-time application, you probably have you know, some bitstream coming at you. Um, and <clears throat> what you need to do is take the bitstream in and package up into Ethernet packets and send those Ethernet packets across the, uh, across the network from one switch to the next. Um, the way you package those samples into packets is the transport protocol. So 1722 is the thing that actually takes the, the actual media samples and bundles them up into an Ethernet frame. And we'll see a little bit about what that means. Are you going to talk more about the stream reservation protocol? Yes. OK. Um, so just as a reference again for how uh, people see these things, these systems fitting together. Um, <coughs> there, uh, as with as with all uh, all networking guys, there are um, you know switches that, that serve to uh, route traffic from one connector to another, and then there are things that there's everything else, the stuff that plugs into the switches that's actually providing the content or or consuming the content. Um, so the, the, the ABB idea is that this is Ethernet. It's compatible with Ethernet, but it's not. That doesn't mean that every piece of Ethernet equipment in the world already is, uh, is capable of doing ABB. So uh, the, the point of this picture is to <coughs> remind people, including the standards developers, that there's this other Ethernet stuff here which does not have the AVB enhancements in it. It's still going to get plugged in. And uh, while it's not expected that AV traffic will flow over here, everything else at darn well better work. Right? So if, if, if this is your PC and you're trying to read your email, it better work with all of this stuff. Um, but at the same time, if this is your new uh, 
you know, streaming streaming media player, um, it doesn't have to work with every piece of Ethernet gear that ever was. And so there's there's an there's an idea that there's um, within the overall Ethernet network there may be a, a section of it which is walled off for uh, audio video capable gear. Yes. Are there any existing switches that are ABB capable? Are there any? Um, uh, I'm aware of one that's been announced. Uh, Harman, uh, in conjunction with uh, Netgear, uh, announced an AVB compatible <coughs> switch. Um, and and I, I shouldn't be so cagey about it. I've seen them. You know, I've seen a, a demo with the things. Um, so I, I believe I, I'm not sure whether they're selling it. <laughs> There's, you can find the press release easily on the web. I haven't found the data sheet for it yet. What does that say about Copernet, which I thought they were supporting? Are they kind of Harman has their high QNet stuff. Right, high QNet. But it's the same technology. Right. Uh, well, I'll ask the question. What does it say about high QNet? Um, hmm. A harmonized ABP. Yeah, so Harman. Uh, it's easy to be, uh, I have to say, you know, in, in working on this, this AVB you know, with this committee, I've been a little bit surprised at the, compared to a lot of other standards activities, uh, the, the kind of nefarious backsetting has been in, in surprisingly short supply, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, uh, I mean, I, I believe in, the IEEE wireless ones are notorious for just just brutal battles between vendors. Um, this is the chip suppliers. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, because they own the intellectual property for mm -hmm. some of the weird algorithms. Uh, but to, to to put it in a different way, the 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 guy who's credited with the invention of CobraNet, uh, Kevin Gross, has been involved with this, and he's been very helpful. Um, Harman uh, has been has been uh, instrumental in getting this ABB stuff to happen, and not not in the sense that no one else could have done it, but they've they've been very generous in contributing time. Right? And again, it's it's whoever walks in the door and actually does work that gets the stuff to happen. And Harman has contributed uh, editors to. Two of the documents and, and contributors on on all of the other ones. So and mostly, would you say mostly the JBL Pro rather than I mean, do they do any consumer? Uh, it's between the, the Pro and the automotive, I think, and I, I don't know the company well enough to. So I would say that it's probably early enough in the adoption curve that even if they do have to do some IT net stuff, I don't care because. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I know that uh, you know Kevin's view of Cobranet <coughs> is that well, you know, that was then. This is now, <laughs> and uh, and it's time it's time to retread the thing. You know, it's time it it, it needs to be it needs to be reexamined and done over again in certain ways. Um, uh, in particular. Um, this this go around compared to what they could do with Cobranet, this go this go around is much higher throughput and is somewhat more flexible. Uh, and and again, if, if you believe this is this is sometimes how you can identify the underlying philosophies for different companies. But if you believe the idea that um, widespread adoption will drive the market for everybody, then you do it. You know, even Harman does it because, I mean, they, they in the audio world they may be big, but in the Ethernet world, they're not that big. And so if if Harman can get, uh, you know, Marvell and Brightcom to 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 get this stuff into everybody's Ethernet gear, then it enables a huge, a, a much larger market for them, and and it drives the prices down. And, and at the same, and as you would know in standards arguments and it also enables their competitors. So, so what do you do?
but uh, in this case, Armin is, you know, without knowing anything about what's going in inside, <coughs> you know, inside the walls from the outside, it's obvious that they're, you know, they're very visibly participating. So I don't know if you're going to talk about this later, but I, I was involved in a project once with, um, we were looking at covert and one of the big limitations was they had a very limited um, bandwidth for parallel control signals. If you were you know, running a system, you needed to, you know, to really switch stuff and control pieces of gear in parallel with running your audio. And that was something that uh, SuperMac and HyperMac addressed. So we could talk about um, the ability to have control signals um, in parallel with the AV screen. Yeah, I mean, I, this is partly, I think, one of the benefits of having this wired so tightly into the underlying Ethernet infrastructure. Right? The, 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 the fundamental idea is if, you, if you're not actually running, if you haven't actually turned on an AV stream, then it's just Ethernet. There's nothing different about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you have a gigabit Ethernet, and you turn on a couple of streams and use up two megabits. You've still got 998 to use for whatever you want. Um, so uh, you know, people. Some people have suggested that they should use reserved bandwidth for control information. And this is getting a little technical. I'm sorry. You, you could do that, but I don't see why you would. Because all you can do is slow down the control traffic by pushing it through a reserve channel. Right? If it's reserved, you cannot go faster than that. Uh, if it's not reserved, you can use every all the bandwidth is available. So, you know, there's been some back and forth on that. I don't, I don't, I don't go for the idea of forcing control traffic into reserve bandwidth. Is it kind of like you're using the holes that the, the, the audiovisual, the high bandwidth stuff, yeah. it has reserved chunks of that of that bandwidth, but the control signals might be using holes that yeah. aren't reserved. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you, you can, well, in fact, so. and they might get dumped. The control guys might get. Them. Yeah, typically, um, typically control traffic. <clears throat> you know, we, we normally expect the uh, packet loss control traffic, of course, you know, there's a recovery mechanism. Um, uh, the, technically, the AVB specification says that you should not reserve more than 75% of the bandwidth on a link anyways. So there's 25%. technically 25% of it is available for whatever else you want. Um, you can change you can change that 25%, 75% parameter if you want. So in effect, what you're doing is reserving some bandwidth for everything else. Um, and by not forcing it into a specifically reserved channel, you get to use whatever there is. And so it, sure. If you could fast forward five years and make the assumption bunch of even decent products out there. What are the things that we as end users would have to be accustomed to looking at in terms of qualifying, you know, what you buy to put things happily in the cloud? And, you know, there's a cluster of terms that we use nowadays, which I think we're all very familiar with, but what happens in five years from now, 10 years? result becomes great, a great big success, and everything is ADB branded, but, you know, where's the vision there? I mean, I, um, <coughs> to me, that's where the uh, pro space and the consumer space really start to diverge, right? Because in the, in the pro space, <coughs> I think we're all accustomed to having, you know, gear that has to be managed and configured and so on, and, and different different companies are better or worse at, at the user interfaces they have, but we all are accustomed to the idea that, of course, I've got to 
configure that this is this is going to talk to that and the you know the redundancy works in some way or another. Um, so in in that space, the um, if you will the competition is over who who is able to provide the you know the cleanest interface to configure all of this stuff and who's able to provide the most cogent diagnostics for what's going on when it doesn't quite work right. right. The, the thing um, in that uh, in that pro uh, live sound uh, application I showed at the start, one of the things that's interesting about that is, <clears throat> of course, you get to um, not drag another ton of cables along with you because you know you just plug everything in with an Ethernet cable. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about it is, um, for the first time, it's possible for a network management station to take a look at what's going on in every single device in the network, in you know every single device on that stage, and and if you know so the companies who are good at this will figure out how to portray the status of these networks in a way that you can rapidly tell what's going on in there and what's going wrong. So the, the point, right now, the point of the AVB stuff, and, and it, it, it struck me that this is actually a, a, a cogent point for discussion, that um, the, the intent of the AVB work in the IEEE is to provide the infrastructure so that all of this can be done. It's not to do it, right? The, the uh, IEEE is not the World Wide Web Consortium. Right? They, you know, IEEE's specifications that do not say anything about, we're talking about protocol layers, it doesn't, you know, ab above about two and a half, the IEEE says, not our job. Um, what their job is, is to make sure that the lower level infrastructure is solid and that it has what you need to tell what's going on in there. Um, but uh, as to how you use that infrastructure, that's, again, at this point, that, you know, that's outside of the scope of the IEEE work. Uh, um, uh, that's not entirely straightforward to do um, because <clears throat> you have to have some understanding of what the, what the higher level application for all this stuff is in order to get the right hooks at the low level. But, uh, but the intent is to walk a line there to make sure that they provide the right infrastructure without at the same time um, trying to over define the problem in a way that uh, uh, constrains or prevents people from innovating uh, with the, the way the endpoints ultimately will work. So in, in, in some sense, it's intentional that it, no one is saying, you know, and here's the screen that you're going to see to set up a connection from there to there. That's not going to happen. That the intent is that two different companies could make two completely different stream, uh, uh, management stations and set up streams, and they look completely different, but they'll both manage the same loudspeaker, for example. Right. So it's uh, sometimes a little bit of a delicate touch to get the right stuff in there, not too much. <laughs> Does that help? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at what are we doing for okay. um, some of these pieces here. Um, the precision time synchronization. I'll have to warn you, is a bit of a pet project with me. Um, not that I've contributed to this one in particular, but it's a, it's a, within networking, it's a, it's a kind of an interesting problem. Um, <clears throat> so what we want to do, we said a microsecond. So what we want to do is have all of these endpoints around this network of a bunch of switches randomly connected together. We want them all to have a clock. And we want those clocks to be synchronized within a microsecond. And it might take a millisecond to get from here to there. Right? So this is like saying, I want to set my I want to set my watch. You in Chicago, you know what time it is. I'm here in Boston. I want to set my watch. And we have 
postcards. <laughs> and I'm going to mail you postcards, and you can mail me postcards, and we're going to set my watch. Say, so, okay, let's see how that works. Um, now, um, and, and in fact, the time scale is almost that extreme. Like a microsecond here, a millisecond across the thing, that's a thousand to one. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, so, uh, 802.1as is, um, is, a, is a relatively standalone set of procedures um, that all of these guys participate in for how to uh, all get organized and get their clocks um, lockstep, synchronized. Um, there is a related, a related protocol in the IEEE called 1588 which does a similar problem. Uh, so AS uh, is built on that um, it <coughs> with uh, uh, some additional support for um, uh, Wi-Fi. And uh, oh, Mocha is the um, uh, data over a cable, uh, uh, residential uh, uh, cable TV wiring. Um, one of the things they do uh, in the protocol is, uh, without anyone particularly being in charge, they nominate someone as the so-called grandmaster, who's the authority on what time it is. Uh, and then everyone's job is to figure out what time it is and set themselves to the same time. Um, uh, in AS, we don't really care whether it's synchronized to the external world. Um, all we're trying to do is make sure that um, within this group of, of devices, they all think they know what time it is. Uh, you know, they all agree within a microsecond as to uh, their local time reference. Um, uh, for 1588, uh, the related standard, people actually care, uh, and the Grandmaster might have a GPS antenna or something attached to it. But that's not a factor in the in AS. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if there was a router guy in the room, if there was, um, the router guy might say, wait a minute, don't we have NTP? Haven't we had NTP for about 100 years? Haven't we solved this problem already? And um, yeah, sort of. Um, the difference is that there, there are two differences. There, uh, there's one technical innovation that that we can touch on briefly here that makes um, 802.1 AS much less expensive for a precise synchronization. Um, uh, but the other difference, and Forgive my attitude, this really bugs me. The other difference is the AS guys just assumed that they were going to tell the hardware guys to put stuff in to do AS. Uh, so of course it's more precise. <laughs> the NTP guys uh, for decades have done the reverse. They've said, no, 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 we're going to run on everything. Um, and their implementations are almost done, almost always done entirely in software. So of course they're not as precise. Um, if you want to buy a precision NTP server, you can get one. You can buy one from Symmetricom. It's good for a few nanoseconds if you want. Um, but um, so it's it's not that there's a fundamental difference, but uh, um, because and this is in some sense a, the plus and the minus because this is done within the IEEE community. They wired it right into Ethernet. Um, so to be on a, to be fair about it, the hardware that they've insisted on having in Ethernet is pretty modest and it'll probably happen. Whereas the NTP guys could never get it to happen. Yeah. First of all, the 8051 in terms of uh, processing capacity, I think we anyone who's worked on this would agree that that's adequate processing capacity. Um, whether uh, 8.1 AS can be done completely in software, 
I would be really surprised if you get, get if you could get a microsecond of accuracy without any hardware support. Um, but in 8051, with a, a little bit of hardware help, uh, I, I think we'd readily get a microsecond accuracy. But I think that's why the the spec decided to force the silicon manufacturers to make some changes. Yeah, and I, it's not exactly that they were. It wasn't exactly guns to the head being forced. I think you know, the people who are doing this are, you know, I mean, it, it is the Marvell and Broadcoms of the world who are pushing this stuff. They they see it as a way to add, you know, a little a little bit more value to their silicon without without costing them very much. So you know, it's uh, the standards in a in a positive way in that sense. Cooperation. Um, the switches uh, in between have put a little bit more priority to the sync signal, so like that that gets packeted and re transmitted and re repackaged and repackaged and stuff quickly, that more so than say the follow up message. In other words, do you need to be fairly secure about when you receive a sync message that it came to you promptly? Um. It's interesting. It actually doesn't matter, and we'll see why in a moment. I think. Um, so the the um, so in getting <coughs> in getting the clock synchronized between all of these devices, there are two parts to the problem. Um, uh, I, you know, if you think of this in terms of grandfather clocks, step one is to make sure they're all ticking at the same frequency. Right? So you want to make sure they're all ticking once a second. Um, that's done with uh, frequency synchronization um, and is relatively straightforward. The guy who is the, the timing master, uh, and again, this, this isn't in dot one AS, timing master is not any magic hardware. It's just there's a vote of one sort or another, and the guy who wins the vote gets to be timing master. Um, so uh, his task is to send. Uh, just periodically send a message saying, yo, time is such and such. Um, and on the receive end, you get those messages, and um, and that gives you a sense for how quickly his clock is ticking, and you lock a phase lock loop onto that, and pretty soon, uh, after enough of those messages, you learn what his clock frequency is. Now, there's a little trick there, and it relates to that delay thing. Um, um, it's what the master is trying to do is to announce his current time, but of course packets are always created in software, and <clears throat> it's kind of hard to know <laughs> in software what is the time going to be when I actually send this packet, right? Uh, so what the way the the way the the way the specification reference points are defined is the time that goes in the sync packet is supposed to be the time at which the packet actually hits the wire, and at the receive end, what you care about is the time when it actually falls off the wire, not the time that the software. No, 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 let's take a look. Oh yeah, maybe I'll get around to it. Not that time. It's supposed to be at the wire. Um, now, again, if you think of the postcard example, <coughs> if what you were going to do was, if what you want to do, write on the postcard the time at which you actually dropped it in the mailbox, that might be hard to do. You can't, you're not going to be able to sit at home and say, you know, I'm going to get this in the mailbox at 10.31.3, because, I don't know, how do you know where you're going to get there? So what they do is, this guy sends a sync message in it with, with a time that says, well, I think it's about this particular time. I'm not sure. And the little piece of hardware here that helps is when that packet actually leaves the box, it writes down a little message saying, it actually left at, a, at the, this exact moment. And then the software can come back and pick that up and put it into a thing called a follow-up message. So back up there, I can easily record the time at which I receive the packet because, you know, here it is, the hardware just stamps it as soon as it comes in. So 
So I know when I received it, and then later I get the follow-up message that said, hey, you know that packet you just got that had a timestamp in it? Well, what it sure said was this. And now we have the exact time at which it was sent and also the exact time at which it was received without having to predict the future. <laughs> Where is this clock? Um, so the piece of hardware that they need, way up here we have the software, which of course has access to real-time clocks and all kinds of things, but the software doesn't know what's going on down at the wire. Right? So what the hardware guys have to do is at the, as close as you can get to the actual wire, what, uh, you know, the Ethernet cable, the hardware guys have to write down what time the packet crossed that boundary. And on the receive end, you just, you know, you, you get the packet, you record the time, you stick it in the packet, and everything is done. Well, is that, that timestamp now part of the lower level message, or are they sticking it into the higher level protocol headers? Well, yeah, so Ethernet by itself doesn't have any timestamps in it. Right? There's nothing about time. So um, <clears throat> what we're going to do on the, yeah, assuming we're transmitting from here over to here, right? way up there, software is going to say, you know, I think it's time to send a sync packet. And I'm looking at my clock, and right now, you know, hey, it's 8.30, so, you know, I don't know, I'll put 8.30 in. Um, that packet with 8.30 in it passes all the way down here. By the time it gets here, we don't know what time it is. But once it crosses this line, this piece of hardware says, I don't know what was in that packet. It can't change it because it's only a piece of hardware. It's not going to go messing with the contents of the packet. But what it can do is say, you know that packet you just sent? I don't know what was in it, but it went out at 8.35 and 3 quarters exactly. So now that can go back up to this piece of software and it can make the follow-up message, which says, you know that one I just sent a moment ago? I thought it was about 8.30, but it was actually 8.35.3. So that's where the follow-up message comes from. And that was, was the timestamp engine only timestamp sync package, or was it available for any package? Uh, or are the packets unique to it? Uh, the, I mean, the hardware we've done is always stamped everything, just because it's easier. Um, uh, and I don't think it matters for any, anything else. I should think we should talk about that again when we talk about 1722. It seems to me that the timestamp that the host originally put stamps on on that sync thing, which is associated with content coming out of the host, it seemed to me that the receiver would be more interested. Yeah. So I that there's number. yeah there's a there is a place. <clears throat> I'm thinking of the hardware implementation of that thing. There there is another place where that that is used and, no, and that's I see what would happen. It, would, it tells you when it really left. It tells you it give, the timestamp engine gives the receiver information about the physical system he's connected to, what he's going to have to do to accommodate delay. Yeah. On a, what he needs to do to equalize delays. But like the audio content, or you know, I mean, if you're going to be syncing up speakers mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, the audio content, the, the timestamp that originally comes out with the content is what's important. Uh, yes, and that passes in a, in a different path. It does right. use it does oh, use this clock. It doesn't use it, that at all. Okay. But it uses it, it uses it does use the clock, but it doesn't use exactly the same mechanism. Right, but isn't it? So wouldn't that would all of the even the content be ultimately uh, synced up to those sync calls? Those sync. Yeah, I mean, again, we should come back to that. There's a there's a slide a couple down where we talk about I'm that part. Sorry, I'm just that's okay. I'm guessing ahead. No, that's good. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, so step step one here is that we're getting the clocks so they run at the same frequency, and and it's the it's the use of this follow up just to. If I could follow up on this with this follow up on your question earlier, um, that's why it doesn't really matter exactly when, you know, how long it takes, right? Because you, what you, from the so the software may start sending it 
way down here, and, and by the time it gets here, who knows what time it is, but the follow-up then compensates for that variability um, so that we know exactly what happens on the wire, and the delay across the wire is predictable, of course, or uh, if not predictable, at least constant. Um, <clears throat> so we have them all, we have them ticking all at the same rate. The next part is a little bit easier, and that is to get them to agree on what time it is. Um, and in that case, uh, again, we have a little problem to solve. Um, that is, we want them synchronized within uh, a microsecond, but uh, the, even the path, you know, even the length of one piece of fiber, maybe many microseconds. Um, so in that case, what we do is, um, again, using the same time stamping hardware, we send uh, a packet in one direction across the wire, measure the duration there, send it back across the wire, measure the duration there, add them up, divide them by two, and that tells us the average, you know, the average, which is the one-way uh, delay, because we add up the two-way delay divided by two, and that way we get the one-way delay. Uh, and that is the number that you need to compensate for the delay through the transmission medium. Um, <clears throat> is, is that happening constantly as, as data is being streamed along, or does it happen once when things are plugged in and become synced? Ah, it happens all the time. Okay. So the, um, the uh, frequency synchronization happens a lot, I think. Uh, the slowest is between 10 and 100 times per second. It's, it, you know, compared to uh, compared to audio bandwidth, it's nothing, but uh, it's 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 regular and it's frequent. Um, if the if the frequency is locked, then um, the delay compensation doesn't need to run very often. Right? So this this might run every few seconds, because of course once once they're locked. It should never change. You know they're locked. Um, so once you've got the delay compensated, it ought to stay compensated. But you know, typically, network guys are paranoid, so you do it again every few seconds just to make sure. It's, you know, people plug cables and random stuff happens. Okay. I think, I think those of us who worry about the content delay, the, you know, the, the internal, uh, who would worry about what would happen if. if the system in, in rechecking and rechecking the delay decides that it's different. It says, well, I guess I'm going to have to pad this speaker with another millisecond delay or, or something. Well, but that's... Sound, it's, sound it's, stage improved. It'd be a phase lock loop, but it would be, something would be changing. It, it would, it would, yeah, so, I, you know, the, the thing you'd ask somebody is... Somebody might notice that when, when, yeah, this, and the, when and the speaker just moved a foot closer to them. Yeah, and the question is, why would that happen, right? If it happened because there's actually something different in the network, then you got to... <laughs> You got to get over it and do it. Right. Um, uh, you know, the millisecond is a long time. Right. Now, I, I, you're exactly. talking about with the clock rates. You're talking about a millisecond. Is, you know, um, yeah, being off by a millisecond would be would be uh, sure. something would be broken. But it's also broken. up to the endpoint designer to say what kind of change can I make in one amount of time, yeah. so that the perception is there or not. And, or you know, when should I bother? When, when should I just let the thing accumulate in a buffer or just right. hang on to this constant delay that I Well, have you, you can see the, di the difference in the signals, and if it changes, then you can have a servo position the speaker. It really change. <laughs> 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 yeah, I see. So you mean when someone trips over a network cable and it stretches it by a foot, <laughs> then you can move the loudspeaker <laughs> by a tenth of an inch. Of course, it makes sense. Uh, Technically possible. Uh, yes. Um, so the, this is one of the. You know, we we talked about NTP earlier. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things that. Um, well, the, so there there will be a learning curve. Um, uh, uh, 802.1 AS does not have anywhere near the field experience. Obviously, does not have the field experience the NTP guys have accumulated, and over the decades they've spent a lot of time figuring out what you do when something not quite it's right nice. happens. That's right. So they, they have they have you know very carefully thought through rules for you know if it's off a little bit then you bring it in slowly and and if it's off too much then 
you know, if it's off a little bit, then you jump, and if it's off way too much, then you you, know, you panic. Oh, red light lights up. On yeah, the and it, and mm -hmm. it, you know, so they they thought through very carefully how to bring it back into balance with as as little disruption as possible, and all of that possible in AS. It's not specified yet. It, it's just that I mean, I haven't exactly done this, but I have had to worry sometimes about lining time. It's one thing to on the initialization part of it, when the guy takes the plug and plugs it in, and, and I woke up, I'm alive, now I've got to figure out uh, how to adjust my time delay. To do it out of knit time is one thing. And then you yeah. take a long time, make your, take, take your time making your decision, make a good yeah. decision on how much delay to put in. And then, and then, then you got to stick with that. Yeah. You just got to stick to it. Otherwise, somebody's going to complain. But when you record a two hour program, your crystal blocks get out enough to do the other series. Yeah, so, so that means you've got to do some. That means there's got to be some. It just slowly, smoothly. It's never perfectly exactly right, but it's tracking smoothly enough. Yeah, so, so, so this thing. Out, yeah. You will get out, and then you won't have to jump. Yeah, so the, I mean, this thing has a servo that runs continuously, so it, it won't. You know, unless something breaks, it'll stay. It will stay synchronized. There's nothing that's going to drift. But it's uh, up to the sort of the device designer to define that. It's not in the spec. So an MP3 player, for example, could just drop samples when you, you know, get away out. get the trouble. But don't, if it's a, well, <laughs> yeah. a high-end audio product, then you're going to want to be able to track and have that smooth. Yeah. But that's not in the spec. That's what well, it is, because that's yeah, I mean, well, no, it gives you the information you need, but what you do with it yeah, is I mean, that's, outside of the spec. Yeah, yeah you're right. I mean, that's, the specification only set, only gives you the enabler to do it, and if you don't want to do it, then that's up to you. But, um, but I, I, I think that, again, that the thing that you know, comes back to how does this process work in the larger scale, the, the um, the hardware required to do this is modest. I mean, they don't. None of this needs fancy crystals and expensive ovens and any of that. It's just ordinary <laughs> stuff with uh, phase lock loops, digital phase lock loops built into the into the Mac chips. Right. So, in, for the silicon guys, <coughs> this, this is why it's so important to get the Brightcons and Marvels on board, because in, inside the Mac chip, you know, compared to a uh, Gigabit and at Phi. This is, you know, there's a little piece in the chip that you could barely see with a microscope um, that just does this. So if if it has gains enough traction that everyone just puts it there, then there's kind of no reason not to do it. Some will think it won't, but yes. So the small uh, level, where does the time delay or time medicalization occur? The receiver or the next person? I mean, uh, talk about an error, but who equalizes the who? Oh well, uh, let me see where if I'm maybe. Well, that's one way. Yeah. Um, so the um, can the the idea is that one of these guys is elected as the master, mm -hmm. and then everyone synchronizes to that master. Right? But how do you make up for the different path lines? Uh, that's yeah. what all of that delay. That thing, that, 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 that thing. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Right, but, but where does that occur? Each, each across each switches. link, across each link. So every switch and every end node does this negotiation across every wire. The wires themselves are of more or less stable length. Yes. Temperature. Excluded. It says, oh, that data I got. Oh, that was supposed to be here. And then, yeah. and then it lines up. receive that data and say, oh, it was all supposed to be here that time. They all put it out. You know, so. it, it seems kind of synonymous uh, in the eye world with like a house sink or a blackberry carriage, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. You have your master clock and everybody else looks at it and says, okay. Yeah, you know, the thing that was, <laughs> that struck me is a little surprising at first. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting on board with this now, but um, uh, I thought, isn't it obvious that this guy ought to be the house clock and that everyone ought to be locked to the house clock? Um, and some of my colleagues pointed out, yes, 
you networking guy, you don't understand. <laughs> uh, it's not just, it's not as if there is the house clock. Um, so in, in fact, um, the, you know, all of this AVB stuff has, this really turns up in the transport protocol, uh, has been def designed in a way that um, the, what we're doing with, with the AS synchronization is we're getting everybody to agree on what, on their own internal idea of what time it is and, and what, the, what their internal frequency is. And then we're using that to convey the house clocks through that same network. Right? So in fact, if you have a house clock uh, or any number of house clocks, um, those actually get transferred across the network as if they were audio streams. Uh, and they, the point of the ABB stuff is to transport them uh, with the same fidelity, timing fidelity, as they would any other stream. So, uh, in fact, within the AVB specification suite, there doesn't have to be any special case for house clocks. It's just another stream that's carried along with all the other streams. And outside of the AVB network, you may say, oh, that stream, that one is the one I should use as my clock for sending, you know, my house clock for sending stuff out. Right. So, um, in, indeed, within the, the network, this acts as you would think of a house clock acting, but it's not the same as uh, what the audio guy sees a house clock. I think the thing to keep in mind to make a difference is that all of the data that is going to the stream is also time stamped. Yes. So, if right. you have two speakers and one of them is only one box and the other is seven box, when the one that's going to get it faster, it's going to look at the That's exactly right, and that's we'll see that in the 1722 part. Um, so, uh, so I warned you. I have an unfortunate soft spot for this timing stuff, but we're done. Okay, we're going to move on. <laughs> well, we're not going to completely move on. I'll admit, but but for the moment, let's pretend. Uh, okay, so um, the the next component was stream reservation. We talked about this earlier. The point of stream reservation is um, to say whether you do or do not have enough bandwidth to carry another stream through your network. And the stream reservation, in this case, um, there are, this is, from a protocol point of view, this is uh, you know, one of the more complicated parts of this kind of stuff. Um, but. In a, in, a, in a simple configuration, it's not that hard. What they do is the guy who is sending the stream sends out a message <clears throat> which says, I propose to send a stream which has the following characteristics, where the, the chief characteristic you care about is how much bandwidth it's going to use up. Um, that, uh, that message is propagated through uh, all of the participating switches to all the way out to all of the potential destinations. Um, and along the way at each point, uh, you know, every point where there's a possible congestion, you know, essentially every link, um, a piece of software uh, that one might uh, compare to a bean counter um, looks at how much bandwidth has been promised already, how much bandwidth they have, you know, what the rules are. And if the rules say it's okay to let this guy in, then it says okay. And if it's not, it says not okay. A gatekeeper. Yeah, that's right. So every, every point, every switch along the way independently does its own gatekeeping calculation. Uh, and then in the second phase, um, a response goes back, and along the way, it picks up the responses along each link. So, uh, if if anybody along the path said, "Oh, oh not okay with me," then uh, you know what started out as a "Yep, that's fine," up here might turn into a "Oh, oh that's not going to work," uh, and that propagates all the way back to here. 
And uh, at that point, you can decide if it's okay, then it's okay, and if it isn't, then it gets. I think I think I read there are 17 different reasons for how it might not be okay. So uh, this guy gets the 17. You know, 17 possible reasons for why it didn't work, and you can decide what to do after that. Um, in this simple version of the protocol, basically everyone gets everything. Um, there's a, <clears throat> there's a, a variation of the protocol that allows you to uh, be a little bit more specific about who's going to get which stream uh, and how much bandwidth to allocate for it. But that's the basic idea anyway. So it's you, you, it's a, a, at least a two-step process where you send out a, a message saying, here's what I want, and you expect to receive a message which says either, yes, everybody who has to say OK has said OK, or you get a message that says, uh-uh, not going to work. Uh, and of course, if you get the message that says it's OK, then that can only happen if there is enough bandwidth to carry that stream. So if you send it, it's, it, there is no reason for it not to get through other than the usual broken wires and checksum errors and lightning bolts and stuff. Could it be made uh, adaptive at the sending end? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, it, that's outside the scope of the specification. But um, if you said here, I want to send this 192 kilo sampling rate, and you get a message back saying, uh-uh, then you could say, well, OK, let's try 96 or 48 or whatever you want. So yes? The, the acts originate with the destination, and then they, they kind of cascade back to the source? Yes. It, so do the all the switches in between, do they have to kind of maintain that reservation request in the queue or hang on to it for a certain number of milliseconds you know, before they decide to grant or reject? Yes. So, and they have to depend on the other guys downstream and see what the acts are. Yes. Coming back. Okay. That's right. All right. Um, and that, that this is, <clears throat> you can tell my biases. This is, that's all done in software. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's it's done, uh, and and one of the things to, you know, one of the rejoinders to that, of course, is, uh, yeah, how many of those are you doing? Um, so the, the AVB and in general, um, you think of as, as if you're working on uh, a thousand streams or less, then it's probably all cool. Uh, if you're trying to do 10,000 streams, then maybe you better think again. Um, because you know, for, if for a thousand streams in your you know, ordinary you know, mid-size Ethernet switch, a thousand streams, Keeping a little bit of state on that's not very much to keep track of. But they have to hang on to that request for a while to see what the guys, oh, yeah. the other guys are doing, and then that becomes that forms the answer that they produce, yeah. the act or the no. Yeah, and they and they have to remember essentially as long as the stream flows because um, in order, I mean that the in order to keep. In order to keep the count of the beams, you must not forget any of them. But the beam, the beam, right? But a beam counter closer to the transmitter, the R guy, mm -hmm. might say, "Hey, this request is fine by me, but I'm telling you no because the guys uh, somewhere uh, down, down, yeah, somewhere further down, downstream so told me that's right. That's and they pass that error message along. That's the point. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So first. So I, I just can't help but think that hardcore networking people may have blindly objected to this because this is this is like a throttling mechanism that you're imposing, propagating over the entire network for someone to <coughs> reserve a stream. Oh, yeah. right. I mean, it's like they're almost emulating circuit switching by saying I can reserve a stream by giving you a dedicated circuit. We are. Yeah, I mean right. it is. But the point is, once you, I mean, there's nothing to stop greedy requesters oh. <laughs> from sucking up. All of these dedicated pathways. Oh man, I, yeah, you know, I, I, I've asked about that periodically as well. Um, I, so I, I, again, if if you were, you know, if there were any router guys in the room, you might again, you might say, uh, RSVP. Haven't I seen this somewhere before? 
Um, so, uh, uh, like, like the NTP question, there is an existing internet protocol called RSVP, which uh, does this um, and has done it for years and has a lot of experience with balancing the um, you know, borderline security kinds of issues against uh, uh, network resource convenience kinds of things. Um, now, it is true that RSVP does not uh, reserve bandwidth on a layer two network. Right? So you, you could view um, the stream reservation 802.1 uh, stream reservation protocol as the, uh, not the last mile, but the last 100 feet uh, of the stream of the reservation for RSVP. Someone could actually link those two together. Um, but within the within the IEEE com, uh, committee, um, there hasn't there hasn't really been. Um, yeah, let me see how to put this properly. Uh, security security uh, and vulnerability issues come up occasionally, but it, it hasn't received a lot of attention. And I think that's partly because the assumption is that these networks are and it's a layer two network. It's pretty contained. In, in part of the reason they made it so layer two is so that it would have to be contained. Um, so it is true that that um, your teenager in the basement <laughs> could take over your AVB network, and your only recourse is to go into the basement and punch them out. Um, that the uh, uh, only up to seventy five percent. Uh, <laughs> yes, you're right. Um, which might be enough to be annoying, or might not. But the 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 assumption, simplify, the simplifying assumption, if you will, has been that um, the network is under one administrative control. I think is a simpler way of putting it, um, and that um, many issues, which in the internet at large, must be mediated through protocols and. Uh, other kinds of mediation, in this case, are relegated to, you know, it's your network, you do what you want. Right? So there is no, there, in, in, to say it a different way, there's no pretense that this is a secure network. It, it, it's it's self-contained, you do what you want, and if you make a mistake, then, you know, the manufacturers of the gear should make it so that you don't easily make a mistake, but if you're bound and bent, then have at it. You mean secure in the sense of I robust, yeah. Would there be a mechanism to throttle individual ports on the switches? I mean, couldn't I mean like kind of a QoS go in and say, yes, that port you can only take ten percent? Um, there are two answers to that. Uh, <clears throat> within the reservation protocol, there's no requirement to do that, but also, there's nothing to prevent you from doing it. Right? It's an administrative policy. Um, if, if, the, if the guy who designs this piece of equipment, I should say this piece of equipment, provides an administrative policy that says you shouldn't allow more than 10% on this link, then when it comes time for the switch to decide whether he has the bandwidth available or not, he gets he can use whatever policy he wants. It doesn't say how you decide how much bandwidth. It just says that you must. And as an asterisk, it says, and it would be a good idea if you didn't accept more than you have. But um, but you're welcome to accept less than you have if you want. So you 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 certainly could implement that policy without. Uh, uh, w well within the, the range of the specifications. There's something else. There's something, oh, I know. Yes, that was that was the reservation part. Once you've made the reservation and said you're going to use so much bandwidth, then this part of the specifications, QAV thing, um, includes. Um, what's called a traffic shaper <coughs> that um, 
if you said you're going to use so much bandwidth, then it kind of keeps you within that. And so if you say you're going to use a megabit, then it, it effectively puts a throttle on the, on the traffic. So if you actually then try and send 10 megabits, then it'll drop a lot of it. Um, this, so QAV um, is, specifies what you put in the switches and the endpoints to make sure that the uh, traffic that you've said you can accept, you can actually get through. Um, so uh, if you think of this in terms of, you know, cars, you know, I think the residential street I live on, uh, 100 cars, 100 cars per hour is probably not any problem for our neighborhood. Um, but if uh, over the course of 24 hours, 100 cars per hour, that's fine. But if all 2,400 people decided at 8.01 they were going to drive down the street, then we would have a traffic jam. Um, so uh, what QAV, the useful part of QAV is to say, <coughs> yeah, okay, you've reserved a megabit per second, um, but you got to space it out properly. You know, so megabit per second, you're not allowed to have 100 megabits all at once and then nothing for the next 99 seconds. That's not fair. Um, so uh, QAV gives a way to ensure that the traffic is, you know, averages out evenly enough. Uh, it is my personal opinion that this is the, you know, the least significant part of the ABB spec, but it's there. Okay, last part. We talked about um, this uh, transport protocol. So as we said, what we're going to do is take streams of samples, we're going to package them up into packets and send them across, across our network. We're going to put them into uh, standard Ethernet frames. So the, the typical way this is displayed is um, as encapsulations on encapsulations on encapsulations. So this first line represents the entire Ethernet packet. Right? So um, uh, according to uh, completely standard 802.1Q, there's an Ethernet header. This is the same as has been done for 15 years. Um, uh, within the Ethernet packet in the payload part, there is a 1722 uh, payload. So this is the, you know, we have space for 1500 bytes here. Now within that 1500 bytes, we're going to put um, a 1722 uh, 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 payload. That contains a small header which identifies which stream, uh, you know, which set of, which, which effectively content of your video stream this is. Um, it has this very important timestamp thing in it. Um, and then it has the, the actual stream data itself. Um, people here use Firewire? I you know, I've seen, you know, okay. So within FireWire, there's, I don't understand how this happened. There's, a, there's yet another standards body, IEC, International Electronic Commission or something. IEC 61883 is a standard which says how you should put uh, audio and video into FireWire. And, you know, it's just a natural fit, wouldn't you think? FireWire, Ethernet, you know, so why not? So um, what we have is um, uh, rather than uh, reinvent all the encapsulations in the world for different kinds of you know, rates and coding and all that kind of stuff, um, they basically suck it in this um, IEC 61883 standard to say how you actually take the samples and pack them together into, into packets. So um, uh, what you have is Ethernet, which contains 1722, which contains uh, IEC 61883 to actually define how you send these samples across uh, across a network. Now, um, so I, I said we were almost done with time, and I can't help it. But as as we said earlier, what what ultimately happens here is um, the guy who sends the packet puts this timestamp into it, and he says, 
I want you to play this out at this time. You know, so all the clocks are synchronized, so he knows what time it is when he's sending it. And basically, I mean, in the, in the simple sense, you say, well, I know what time it is right now. Add two milliseconds, stick it in there. Um, and then when you're playing it out, uh, at the end point, you receive the packets. It's even a, they must stay in order, so that's good. So right here, when you're about to play, play out the stream, you say, I'm going to hold on to it until the timestamp says what time it is. And when my clock says it's the same as the, trans, as the transport uh, presentation time, then that means it's time to play it out. Um, so um, you can probably guess that there's hidden in here another phase lock loop. Um, and <clears throat> this is a long way around of answering uh, an earlier question. This is this is where the house clock comes through. Also, that that the house clock gets clocked in up here at the at what you know whatever rate it's coming in, and ultimately this phase lock loop makes it come out the other end at, at the same rate. So um, that's the second use for the timestamp. It's going to be the house clock and two millisecond delay. Two yeah, yeah, that's right. That, that yes, that's right. So, um, uh, yeah. So that's the that's the key element in the in the delay equalization thing. We got the first part with AS with getting the clocks synchronized, and then the second part is using it using the synchronized clocks here to make sure that they play out at the right time, regardless of uh, how much delay it took to get here. But the two milliseconds is, as you say, just a sort of programming stop factor that you know this is the maximum propagation across the network. You want to make sure that what you put in doesn't get there after it was supposed to be going out. Yeah, so yes. You just, so you just make it two milliseconds later, so uh, all yeah. of these delays are compensated. Y yes, that's right. And so in the case, <coughs> uh, in these, um, uh, let me see, so there's been some, there's been some analysis done, that, you know, Predicting delays through networks <laughs> is uh, um, a thankless job. Um, the, 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 uh, the basic idea of estimating the delay from one end to another is very straightforward. But if you get tasked with saying, what is the worst case delay? And if it's worse than the worst case delay, I'm going to shoot you. Then the answer is quite challenging. But so there's been some analysis done Two milliseconds for a seven hop network without any unusual properties is viewed as a pretty safe bet. Um, and so the, the value of two is programmable. Uh, so for these large, you know, for the large pro audio touring systems I'm looking at, we'll probably turn it up higher than two. Um, again, because uh, you know, two milliseconds of delay in a system that the loudspeaker itself is 100 feet tall. I don't think I care. Um, as long as it's constant. As as uh, of course, yes. I mean, it's it's, it's critical that it that everyone agrees on what the numbers are. But two milliseconds or three or five isn't going to matter. Um, in the, the 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 most compelling case I've heard for why you want to be pretty careful about. The delay, even in that, even in the live sound situation, is uh, in ear monitors, where microphone to earphone. You know, if you don't watch that, that can get pretty disturbing. So, but again, I, I think most people believe two milliseconds is in, inconsequential there. Also, if you're trying to you have unique bigger buffers, right? Yeah, but these, compared to gigabit networks, these are not very big buffers. But yeah, technically, you're right. It it costs a little buffer space. And that two milliseconds is based on if it was all 100 megabit. If you had all gigabit, uh, yeah. it would be a tenth of that. Um, yeah, except that the. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> some components of it would be a tenth of that. That's right. Um, the, the speed of light part, of course, is unchanged. And, uh, <laughs> and, and various other overhead factors tend to not go down very easily. But, but yeah. It's based on our megabit numbers. Is it for 
programmable to less than two? Um, let me see how to answer that. This is uh, the range of the programmability. Uh, and it's interesting. So far, the range of the uh, programmability I don't think has actually been. Well, does the standard say only the two is the maximum? Or? No, no. It it just says the two is the default. And I'm I'm trying to think of if there what in the standard would would limit either the low or high end of that range. And uh, I can't remember, but the, it's it's. I'm sure, from a standards point of view, it can be set very broadly. Um, the, the packet width is going to limit the low end. I mean, you can't you can't send a packet out until you collect all the information. From Indeed, the end. that's right. So there, so that's so, so, so so store and, old, but yeah, store, there are store and forward delays that would say you you could under certain circum you know constrained environments you could you could set it to less than a millisecond. Um, but as you say, there are there are certain physical limits where it just won't work. You set it too small. What yes. Is your biggest overhead in many other pieces of equipment still your encoding decoding factor? Um, yeah, and what, that's so. In this case, um, all of the all of the audio coding formats that are supported by 61883, they're all uh, PCM. So there's there's no compression, decompression delay. I don't mean that. I mean transferring it from one standard to the Ethernet and then back out again. Yeah. So you've got to change it into Ethernet packets and then transfer it back to ADSU or Yeah. So what you what you cannot avoid is, is what's called the far and far delay that is you, is you're suggesting you have to collect enough stuff to put into the packet and you have to collect it before you put it there. So that, that's one fundamental limit. Now one of the things someone asked earlier, how many channels can you fit? Um, and <coughs> just in case this isn't complicated enough, um, if you want to reduce the store and forward delay, then you make the packet smaller. Right? Because smaller packet, you don't have to wait as long for the for the bits to flow in, so you can build a packet quicker, so you can send it sooner, and that reduces your delay. That's the good part. Um, the bad part is the header didn't shrink. <laughs> so, um, so if you're not careful, you'll end up sending you know, 150 bytes of header and 20 bytes of payload, uh, and the delay is very short. Uh, and the overhead is very high, so the number of channels that you can support goes down. Now, as a standards guy, I'm saying, here are some knobs. Have a good day. <laughs> um, you get to you get to tune um, what kind of channelization you want, how much delay you can tolerate, and and uh, uh, and and how much overhead you can stand. But you know, I mean, it's not that it's not that hard. It's flexible. Something else? Well, a sort of real physical and acoustical question having to do with how big you set this overall delay. I've heard that you actually do get tempering effects between what people hear through bone conduction uh -huh. when they're speaking and the delay of the signal coming in the radio monitors. It produces some rather odd coding effects which is time down to the Oh, interesting. <coughs> it makes the monitors almost unusable. Yeah, so what is in that notch frequency range of human voice, for example? Yeah, so what do you think the LA number should be for in your monitors? Nothing short of possible. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> it does also make the argument that multi channel is better because if you're gathering up data for 16 channels and shutting it into a 1500 packet header, then your time resolution yes, will be right. better from an efficiency point that, of view. That's, that's right. And, and that's a just to, to fill in a bit of background on that on that statement, the what I didn't show in the six one eight eight three in in this uh, encoding um, you you can vary the length of the packet as you can make the packets longer and shorter by putting more or fewer samples in them. 
Um, so you can send a single stream, uh, you know, a single channel with um, many samples in one packet if you want. That gives you good efficiency but long delay. Um, if you have many channels independently running in parallel, um, uh, you know, a, a, you know a, a dozen independent microphones all running at once, you can package um, uh, many of those channels into one a 11722 stream, which contains many audio channels. Uh, and that's another way of making the packets larger, reducing the overhead, but not causing the delay to go through the roof. Well, would you have one single 61883 inside your 1722, or would you have multiple of those? Yeah, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, yeah so 6183. Yeah, is one of the, the, on the bottom, one of those or yeah. two of those inside? Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's one. Um, okay, and then what do you do about the... Uh, well, because you know, because that's only pushing the problem down one level. Right? 6183 has a lot of knobs and buttons okay. in it for combining different different right. things. So that, that's the same idea as what was the early downfall of Boyd before they had to figure out how to get multiple packets or uh, yeah. multiple uh, chunks of data in Yes, so voice over IP has exactly the same problem, only in some sense, well, in, in some sense, a notch worse. In the voice over IP, the, uh, it, it's critical that it works on much lower bandwidth networks, so they, they don't have, the, they don't have the, the luxury of saying, uh, we're going to run 192 kilohertz sample with 24-bit PCM. <laughs> um, so they, they have to make it work with uh, very low sample rates, which means, and they, in the real time, it's an inherently real time two way conversation. So um, they, they, they are very careful about controlling the overheads on their packets so they can keep them small and not blow too much on the headers and so on. Um, this one, so the, the problem is the same. This, in this world, the constraints are a little easier. You know, they, they haven't, they haven't you might guess here, they haven't really stayed up exactly all night, every night, working on reducing the packet overhead for 1722. Okay, um, there's one more piece of AVB, which is not done. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the, the doneness of all of this stuff in the next slide. Um, so, what we've talked about so far is <clears throat> uh, if endpoint A and endpoint B had already agreed by magic that they were going to send traffic to each other, then here's what they would do. And you might say, well, wait a minute, how did they know? <laughs> um, so there's a whole another piece of, the, of this protocol suite which uh, is, goes under the title of connection management that is um, uh, if you will, higher layer software protocols to figure out who it is that wants to send what to whom, uh, how they're going to find each other, how they're going to agree on what they're going to send to each other, how they're going to agree on what coding formats they're going to use, and so on. That work is underway currently in the in the uh, in these IEEE committees. the The basic idea at this point is think patch panels. Right. We, there are a million things you could do here. This, this kind of thing has a chronic history of mission creep. Um, so what we're trying to do is just stick to the idea of, you know, think about a patch panel. You got a, a bunch of things that can make content, a bunch of things that want to receive content. Some of them have square plugs, some of them round plugs, and you've got a bunch of cables and, you know, hook them up. Um, the uh, on the network devices should advertise their ability to do AVB so that you can plug in a network management station or something or Mac or you know your PC and see on the network which devices out there are capable of doing AVB and what their what they are and what their capabilities are um, and then either the devices themselves or a management station should be able to say um, you know, oh, DVD player, you over there, hook on to that loudspeaker and that loudspeaker, right? and have then the connection get 
made. Um, this work has <coughs> all kinds of different constraints. Um, the hardest one, a couple of the hard ones being to make sure it doesn't get too complicated. Is, uh, this, this kind of stuff is, is chronically very challenging to solve every problem for a connectivity. Um, uh, one, another of the constraints is that whatever it is has to work over a, a kind of wide range of equipment. This is, again, where the pro and, and consumer world, I think, will start to look a lot different. Um, uh, it has to, whatever it is, has to work, of course, reliably, and it has to also start pretty quick after a power failure. Um, certainly, <coughs> I'm sure we all would agree with that, but the, the pro sound case, um, it would be a good idea if, you know, like a power failure might happen, and when it comes back on, it would be a good idea if the system worked uh, without having to. If it knew how to reconnect itself. Yeah. Because it would be me. It was like power fails, it comes back up, it's starting from scratch, and then and it needs to figure out who what did I have connected to who would now send them. Right. Those so the calls down. Right. So yeah. the, the simple goal is somehow or another remember what you were doing and do it again um, up to a point. Uh, because, of course, uh, the power might have failed because it just someone kicked the plug out and they plugged it back in, or it might have failed because someone kicked the plug out and then put all the stuff in a truck and drove it 8,000 miles and <laughs> put it all back in a different way and it came back up and said, let's go, and you say, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, it, it, there's a balance here. Uh, you know, one of the rules is um, make sure it comes back up quickly. The other rule is do not make sound unless you're authorized to make sound, um, because uh, uh, this could be dangerous to people's health. So there's, you know, there's an interesting balance. Maybe, there. maybe why we would have clock, you know, battery powered clocks in, the, in all the devices so that if it was 22 hours later, yeah, then, then, it's a new day. Yeah, yeah that's right. It was five seconds later. We would want to you should, the yeah, that's right. So the, there's there's a lot of stuff to be discovered there. So let me finish by talking a little bit about status. Um, the, uh, the timing one, queuing one, and the um, bandwidth reservation one are all in um, what's called the final ballot status, so they're effectively done, and at this point the concrete is pretty darn firm. The uh, 1722 transport is almost that far along. It hasn't started what's called sponsor ballot yet, uh, but it's pretty close. And 1722.1, the connection management one is really you know, starting. There have been, I guess, three meetings, three face-to-face -face meetings on it so far, and there's a lot a lot left to do. Um, there are a couple of silicon vendors uh, who have, been, I think, actually announced support for EVB devices. Um, and I think they were all listed on the slide at the front anyways. Um, uh, there's, there is one uh, AVB switch, I just said Harman in, Harman in conjunction with Netgear have announced an AVB compatible uh, Ethernet switch. Um, uh, I know there are a couple of small vendors who have announced AVB compatible endpoints. Um, I don't think there are any uh, products from well-known, you know, uh, companies for AVB endpoints yet, although I, I know they exist in labs, so it's getting there. And as we said, the, the ProSan guys are currently leading. And um, this is the place where I will make my pitch again. If there's anyone involved in consumer electronics who is interested in this, this is a good time to participate uh, because this this stuff is what's going to make it interoperable and it would be really good to have the right kind of input. So if there's anyone who wants to talk about that, well, let me know. Um, if you want to know more, um, the 802 website has uh, a variety of uh, 
some of some of the material is public. Um, the actual draft standards are not public, but the contributions are. So you can go and take a look. Uh, I can perhaps uh, send this to Tony to publish on the on the local mailing list. Um, there's one other piece here. Um, the standards are being developed as part as under the auspices of the IEEE, which is uh, an open organization, anyone can come and contribute. There is also uh, an industry trade alliance called AVNU, and AVNU is, uh, is, has been in existence only for a few months now, but um, the intent of AVNU is to, uh, not to define standards, but to um, work on uh, uh, interworking agreements among participating companies to uh, more narrowly define what you have to do to <coughs> to interoperate with uh, with ABB. Um, uh, I think we've seen this with the distinction between uh, 802.11 and Wi-Fi, that there's a lot of stuff in 802.11. Um, um, and if you, you can pick and choose what you want to do out of 802.11, if you pick and choose the wrong thing, it won't interoperate. It'll work, but it won't interoperate. Um, if you do uh, Wi-Fi, then it is, you know, the intent of Wi-Fi is to make sure that it interoperates with other equipment. Um, Avenue is also a source for uh, uh, a, a supply of white papers on stuff about DVB in different applications. So. so. It's also a resource. And 